community development, but I think some of you may have been that. Mark Lawson from the South Dakota Housing Development Authority is with us uh, as well. So I appreciate their time coming down. Uh, we've done a number of these throughout the state, and we'll talk about kind of statewide uh, what these opportunity zones look like just real briefly. Uh, but this is the seventh one I've done, so uh, I hope, hopefully it's improved from the first one. So you guys can judge that. <laughs> Uh, you know, so as I was on my way down here, I was thinking, um, you know, sort of wanted to open it with something that was kind of funny, lighthearted, a joke. Um, I had it all set up, and then Nancy said she wants to record this, so I feel <laughs> a little bit shy now about saying this. I have a confession to make. Um, I actually, as we were growing up in here, playing football, uh, I didn't like Yankee. <laughs> um, in fact, I hated coming down here because it was always the longest bus ride back in the season. So usually, if you guys were around in the 90s, we usually had, you know, 60 four-hour ride home with some angry coaches. So that's my memory growing up. Um, but since I came back to GOED in 2014, uh, I will say my memory and, and experience with the Yankees is a lot different than that. And I leave here to drive back to here energized because I see a lot of things happening in this community here. I see a lot of forward thinking, a lot of people who are dedicated uh, to the work of economic development in the community. And I'm really excited to be able to talk about these opportunity zones because I think that will be a very good uh, addition to the toolkit that you have here in Maine. So I uh, appreciate the chance to, to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on. So I'm going to run through, and, and I think we have people here who are maybe at different levels of experience and, and knowledge about Opportunity Zones. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page. I'm going to give some background on what the Opportunity Zones are. I'm going to you know, define some key terms and concepts that you should be thinking about as, as you're thinking about how to apply these Opportunity Zones uh, in Yankton. And that's really what this talk is about is to get you thinking about how to use this as a tool. Um, I want to talk about some of the benefits as we see them from our office, uh, both in terms of benefits to the investors who might have some money to put in, benefits to the businesses who might receive that money, uh, and then I think most importantly benefits to the community, how to use this as an economic development tool. And then I also want to leave you with uh, a few examples to kind of get you thinking about how to use this and, and uh, <coughs> So welcome. Uh, go ahead and find a seat. And as we're kind of going through today and talk, if you have questions at any point in time, feel free to interrupt me. Um, as I said, this is now my seventh time. So if I can't get back on track after you interrupt me, I probably haven't done my homework. So um, feel free to ask questions at any point in time. Bruce, good morning. How are you? So um, this morning, I guess I wanted to, again, just kind of go over some talk about some background. So what is an opportunity zone? Why are we here and what are we talking about? Um, really the, the thing today uh, that I wanted to talk about with the opportunity zone is a federal program that was passed in the Tax Cuts and Job Act of 2017. So last December, that big tax bill that went through Congress. Uh, they put a little provision in there that changed some tax treatment for capital gains for investors. Capital gains is if you buy stock at $20 on Amazon and sell it for $200 later, $180 gain that you have to somehow uh, well, pay taxes on. And so they changed how the, uh, how the IRS will, will take care of that tax uh, tax bill. So there are a couple important concepts uh, through this Opportunity Zone program. And the first one is the Opportunity Zone itself. And so uh, think of the Opportunity Zone as a, as a geographic area. Okay, It's defined on a map. And I'm going to show you a map of what Yankton has. Uh, and this area is divided by uh, what they call census tracts. So every 10 years, we, you know, the, uh, every 10 years, the Census Bureau counts everybody in Yankton, counts everybody statewide. So they've divided the whole country into these little tiny census tracts. Uh, every place has at least one of them. Yankton has a few. Uh, some of our smaller communities just have one. But the opportunity zones are defined by a census tract. And so as we talk about this, uh, just kind of keep that in mind. The geographic area. So the thing to know about the Opportunity Zones, there are 25 of these in South Dakota. Uh, so there are 8,700 across the entire country, but only 25 in South Dakota because they were apportioned or kind of divvied up by population. So uh, South Dakota being a low population state, we got 25, uh, but we put quite a bit of thought into where these would go. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the state process <coughs> if you're all interested. This kind of dates back to early part of the year. We had a lot of conversations with Nancy and, and, and Don and other folks here in Yankton 
where, where would, this would be good to put uh, in terms of reacting. So the goal really is to, is to leverage what is an estimated $6 trillion worth of wealth that's out there with individuals who have you know, investment property or stocks that have appreciated and moved up in value, but they're not selling them because there's a tax issue that they're gonna create for themselves. So uh, the thought was if we give a, a tax benefit to people, they might be more interested in you know, moving some of those assets and selling them and then taking that money and reinvesting it into projects that benefit communities. So that's the goal here. And it's kind of the, the, the new way that I think the, the administration in Washington is looking to, to finance a lot of kind of public development and, and community development activities is to leverage that private sector dollars and put those to work. And so this tax, uh, treatment as tax uh, benefit is kind of a one important tool for how to do that. So Opportunity Zone, again, that geographic area, uh, Yankton has, has two of them. Uh, and we'll talk about where those are at. So the Opportunity Zone is that geographic area. The second important concept, and one that we should probably spend some time talking about, is what's called an Opportunity Fund. And an Opportunity Fund is a lot like a, a mutual fund or a private equity fund that has money in it from investors. And then that fund, will invest in projects in an opportunity zone, either a business or other some for-profit activity. Uh, so the money that comes into an opportunity fund comes from those investors. It's the capital gains that they get from selling their property, that stock or that investment property, quarter land, whatever it is. Uh, they put it into an opportunity fund, and then that opportunity fund is required to invest at least 90% of their assets in the opportunity fund in the projects in that opportunity zone. And opportunities. Um, so when this program was first passed, everybody expected these opportunity funds to be these giant, huge, you know, billion-dollar investment funds that would be run from New York, Chicago, other big, you know, big cities. Um, what it looks like is happening now is the IRS has, has uh, allowed what's, what's called self-certification for uh, an opportunity fund, which I think opens up a lot of possibilities to do smaller funds and, and funds that may even just be focused on an individual project or. Deal, uh, because you have to set up a, a separate legal entity, but it, it, there's no requirement that you have like a billion dollars in the opportunity fund. There's no requirement that you have, you know, a, a specific fund manager. There's not a license process you have to go through with the U.S. You know, IRS. You don't have to fill out a bunch of paperwork and send it in and then have <coughs> somebody to decide whether or not you're an opportunity fund. You set up your fund and then you self-certify and send in a little tax form that hasn't been released yet. We'll talk about what still needs to happen. Uh, but that little tax form basically says, I'm an opportunity fund, this is where I'm investing, um, and this is, you know, as a result, the tax benefit that I'm claiming from the IRS. So <coughs> it opens up a lot of possibilities for, for South Dakota because we don't have to necessarily uh, you know, go to a, a big, huge fund and compete with the other 8,700 uh, you know, opportunity zones across the country. Uh, and I think it opens up the possibility even for some you know, Main Street and small business opportunities as well. So uh, I'm interested to see what happens with some of the IRS uh, guidance that comes out, but so far it looks very positive for, for us in South Dakota. The other thing I wanted to just note on the, the opportunity funds is that they, uh, they don't have to invest in just one business or in just one opportunity zone. You can invest in multiple opportunity zones, you can invest in multiple businesses, uh, but you also could just invest, according to what I'm seeing in the law, and what everybody seems to have, have uh, uh, kind of agreed on in terms of the, the community that's following this issue, you could just do a, almost a single purpose fund just for one project, and that would be okay too. So again, a lot of opportunities. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what's eligible, what's not, and how to use this in different uh, types of projects. But just in short, really, the, the only things that are not allowed uh, are what they call kind of the sin and vice industry. So that would be things like uh, you know, massage parlors, gambling, casinos, things like that. And they also include golf courses in there. I'm not sure exactly why, except that we're both making a lot of sin. So, um, but otherwise, it's pretty wide open. You know, it seems that manufacturing businesses would pretty clearly qualify. Uh, it looks like we would also be able to you know, support retail, entertainment, um, housing, we'll talk a little bit about some housing opportunities. So uh, there's a lot of potential here for a variety of different projects to fit the community. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about how this can impact economic development, kind of what's the biggest piece of this that I think is, is the takeaway for economic development. 
and it's just that it will unlock, I think, a tremendous, potentially a tremendous amount of capital that we can use for projects. Um, what it can't do, though, in terms of economic development, is it can't take a bad project and make it a good project. So if the project was never going to cash flow, if there was never going to make any money, it's, it's probably not going to be attractive for an investor because as you're going to see from the benefit side, the investor needs to be able to exit out of their investment at some point to realize the best gain, and that's after about 10 years. Uh, so it has to be something that's sustainable and going to create cash. It has to be a profitable business. Um, it also can't create projects by itself. Uh, so you know, it's up to all of us in the community. Uh, it's up to YAPG. It's up to GOED to identify good opportunities. It's up to you know, the local banking community and CPAs to advise clients on the opportunity that this presents for their business. So I think that, you know, that's something to keep in mind. There's going to be a lot of work still required on the community side uh, in order to make sure that people can take advantage of this, uh, this program. Uh, the last piece that also I want to mention is it doesn't guarantee financing. It doesn't guarantee money is going to come to projects. So this isn't the kind of federal program where, you know, they just said, we're going to put a billion dollars worth of money out there and people can, you know, put in a grant application and get it. This is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tax benefit. So you have to find an investor and make your case why your business is going to be successful and attract that investment into the business. So it's, it's not going to be, you know, a, a handout program from the government, but I think that there's some real advantages to that, too, and I'll, I'll talk about some of those as we kind of go through. Uh, this is the part I kind of like the best because I get to throw the federal government under the bus a little bit. Uh, so what still needs to be done? Uh, you know, this was, was passed at the end of last year. Uh, they really asked for a really rapid turnaround at the state level in terms of finding the right zones to, to designate. So they asked us to go through within about the space of about 60 days, not even 60 days, uh, and figure out what we wanted designated. And so uh, earlier this year, Governor Dugard asked our office to take the lead, but we worked very closely with South Dakota Housing, uh, with the Department of Tribal Relations, identify some places in South Dakota that we thought would work. Uh, so we got our business taken care of and we sent in our recommendations to the governor and he then approved those and sent those in to, to the Treasury Department back last March. And then they turned around in April and designated our, our spot. So we were one of the first states to get things designated. A lot of the other bigger states asked for extensions and spent a lot of time trying to figure out what they were doing. They didn't get theirs designated until about June. So it kind of set the whole program back. Uh, so right now we're waiting for a lot of things to come out from the IRS. Just a lot of regulations, a lot of rules and guidance that still needs to come out. Uh, so you know, as we kind of talk about questions and answers, I'll, I'll tell you what I know based on what I'm hearing and what we've seen so far for guidance. But the, the, the caveat I'll, I'll give you is you know, that, that could change. There could be some changes that the IRS will bring out. The good news is it's just within the last few days they've said that within the next month, they're going to issue some additional guidance. So within you know, probably three to four weeks, we'll have a much better idea of where they're going to head with this. So by the end of October, I think, we'll have a, a pretty clear picture. Uh, we probably won't have final rules at that point, but we'll, we'll at least know where they're going. So I think that'll be better in terms of planning for some projects. But just some specific uh, you know, things that, uh, just kind of some examples of why this, this process of defining some of the rules is really important. Uh, one of the key things, I think, that uh, it's going to have to be worked through is what I would kind of call related party transactions. So could you have a small business owner who has a quarter section of land, you know, ag land, that he's had for 10 years, and it's appreciated in value, so the value's gone up, he decides to sell that. Could he take that money, that gain that he realizes on that property, and then could he open up an opportunity fund just for himself? Because remember, it's self-certified. So could he set up a little you know, corporation just for himself certify that as an opportunity fund, put his money in there, and then use that opportunity fund to invest back into his own business and get a tax break. I mean, if that's possible, that's a huge change in the way that our small businesses would, would potentially benefit from the tax code. Uh, and I'm really curious to see whether the IRS allows that, because uh, that could be a huge boon to you know, small business and a lot of businesses in South Dakota, but it could also be a big revenue loss for the federal government. So. I'm going to be interested to see what they do with, with that. Um, if they do allow something like that, it's a huge, you know, huge potential uh, for, for the state. 
If they come back and say, well, you can't do that, you can't invest in your own business, or they say you have to be one of five or six people who invest in the business, you know, that'll change the attractiveness to, to a lot of small businesses. So that's one area that needs to be addressed. There's some technical definitions that have to be clarified, things that attorneys like me and the accountants really you know, kind of get into, what's the definition of qualified business property, things like that. Uh, so that'll have to get defined. And then the other one, and I think probably the biggest issue that I'm seeing potentially, uh, is this is where the kind of the delay is really cost, I think, the program, is the, the designations for these opportunity zones sunset in 2028. So that designation goes away. So that's 10 years from now. Um, as you're gonna see, the best benefit to an investor happens when they hold their investment for 10 years or more. And so what happens if you have an investor put their money into an opportunity fund and a project in 2020? So now they have eight years that they hold their investment before that designation goes away. Are they gonna get grandfathered for the next two years? Or are they gonna have to pay some sort of tax on 2028 when it goes away? Because what you're gonna do, <coughs> by far the best benefit from this program happens after 10 years. Otherwise, it's a possible benefit over what exists now. So that's a big issue. Uh, these are not issues that just I've identified. There's a big coalition of uh, nonprofits and law firms, accounting firms, economic development groups out in Washington that's been following this uh, program. And they wrote a letter back in June to the IRS. It was a very lengthy letter, identified a lot of different areas that needed to be clarified. So uh, the good news is, within a, a month, I think we should have a much better idea of where that's going. And, and certainly, we'll be pushing out that information when we get it. So let me talk more specifically about the benefits. Uh, I'm going to start with the investor. I'm going to talk then kind of through the business and the community. The investor piece of this, I think, will help you understand from a business and community standpoint how to use it and why it's, why it's helpful. So the, the biggest, uh, the way that it works is, is, so ordinarily if you have that Amazon stock and you sell it at $200 a share and you bought it at 20, you have $180 worth of gain. And that's usually taxed in the same year that you sell the property. So you're gonna pay capital gains tax on that. So this program allows you, if you take that $180 and invest that into an opportunity fund, you defer paying taxes on that $180. So you end up paying the tax on that $180 either at the end of 2026 or if you sell out <coughs> in the opportunity fund before that when you exit the opportunity fund. So you're going to defer your tax for a few years. So there's a benefit there because you can you know, take that money and invest it someplace else uh, or you know, not have to pay the tax. So there's a little bit of a benefit up front. Uh, the benefits start accruing though over time. So after five years when you have your money in the opportunity fund, um, you actually have 10% of your original investment that gets free from tax forever. So you know, if you had $180 you invested, five years later, if you exit, you're only gonna have, or you'll have uh, uh, $18 that wouldn't be taxed. So you're gonna save a little bit of the <coughs> tax bill if you hold your investment for another two years, so seven years total, you get another 5% of what they call step-up basis. So if you end up with 15% of your original investment, or in this case it would be $27, that wouldn't be subject to tax. You're still going to have to pay some tax, but you don't pay as much as you would have before. So uh, there's a benefit there, but the biggest benefit, is, as I mentioned, happens at 10 years. And that's because you get all those other benefits I just talked about get that deferral for a few years, you get that step up basis that allows you to protect some tax. But at the 10 year mark, anything that you make on your original investment, any gain on that original investment into the opportunity fund, when you sell out, exit the ex opportunity fund, that gain is all tax free. So if your $180 investment in the opportunity fund doubles in value, and now all of a sudden you have $360, so you have a $180 gain, that $180 gain is not taxed when you exit the opportunity fund. So that's a lot of words. I'm a lawyer, so I like words. I'll show you a graph. This is what it looks like from a, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> down the house. So this is what it looks like from uh, in a visual way. Um, so you can see on the right hand side over 10 years, this is comparing an opportunity fund investment to a regular mutual fund, both of which are earning 7% per year. So the, 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 the 
same you know, return on each side. Over 10 years, you get $44 more out of an opportunity fund than you do just a regular mutual fund at 7%. And that's because at that 10 year mark, when you sell out, all that gain you get comes out tax free. So you see on the left hand side, the five and seven year mark, there's a little bit of an advantage, but it's not a huge advantage. There's $9 more over five years, $15 more <coughs> over seven years on a $100 investment initially. And that five years, you know, really kind of what's going on there is that it takes about five years for that mutual fund to kind of make up the ground to make back the money that you had to pay in capital gains up front. So when I talked about deferring for that period of time, deferring that tax, that's, that's really kind of the magic at five years. And then, you know, seven years is just kind of compounding. That's just kind of the magic of having your money in for, for longer. Uh, but again, that 10 year mark is really where the sweet spot is uh, in terms of being able to realize for the investor the best benefit. Uh, and these are not my figures, by the way. This is, this is a big bank in Washington, D.C. that's run all the analysis for you know, the general taxpayer situation. So um, I probably should have mentioned that Point up front, I'm not giving legal or tax advice here, so uh, you have to consult your attorney and account and all that. Uh, so this is the visual way of, of looking at the benefit. So what does that mean for a business? Uh, so you have an investor who you know, wants to put money into an opportunity fund, now the opportunity fund has money. What does a business get by working with an opportunity fund? I think there's a number of advantages here. Uh, so the first one is just clearly it's a source of capital that they wouldn't have otherwise had. Nancy, your office probably works with a lot of the same kind of business as we do, where they come in, they have a good business, but they don't have a lot of you know, spare cash laying around, not a lot of equity laying around. So it's hard to go to a bank, get financing, the collateral might be a little thin. So getting some extra capital out there to help businesses is I think one of the principal benefits to a business. Uh, the second one is that it's long-term patient capital. So it's not somebody putting their money in and wanting to exit three, you know, three years later. Because the best benefit to that investor through the opportunity fund is that 10 years. So it encourages them to keep that money in longer. There's some other advantages too. You know, it's, it's, there's no real requirement for, for the capital amount. You, know, you don't have to put a million dollars in. There's no requirement to put 500,000 in. It's whatever the business needs and you can convince an investor to do. Uh, there's also not a lot of restrictions in terms of what's eligible for, for, for property. You know, it could be real estate. Could build a new building, could expand a building. Uh, there's also provision to do equipment, you can do equipment with it. Uh, there's some, <coughs> some technical issues associated with that. So if you're buying into a business, you know, that investment's supposed to substantially improve the business. And, you know, that's kind of the legal test for it. Well, the IRS needs to kind of say, what does substantially improve mean? You know, is that you know, taking down a, a multifamily housing unit to the studs and totally rebuilding it, refinishing it, making it like new? I'd say that's probably going to qualify. <coughs> just putting, you know, just tearing out carpet and putting paint on the wall, is that going to qualify? I don't know. I can't tell you that. So, uh, but again, uh, <coughs> real property and equipment both eligible. And then I think the last thing I like about this is that it, it doesn't really cost the business anything in terms of compliance. The compliance issues are really for, for the opportunity fund and for the taxpayer. When the taxpayer files their, their tax return. The business doesn't have to get involved with whether an investor qualifies or not, it's really kind of transparent to the business. So the business can keep on focusing on their work and not on the sort of tax compliance issue. So how about for economic developers and communities? This is, I think, the last piece. Um, you know, for, from my perspective, from our office's perspective, this is a really powerful incentive tool, uh, both for helping existing businesses within a community expand, as well as potentially attracting new businesses to the community. And I'll, I'll run through a couple of examples how I think that that could work uh, to show you sort of you know, from a project standpoint how that, how that could work. Um, you know, I talked about it being pretty flexible. You know, there's not a lot of restrictions other than golf courses and the sin advice business. Uh, so I think that, that opens up a lot of possibilities. You know, a lot of uh, economic development programs through the state and other federal programs are really focused a lot on you know, manufacturing uh, and not as much on retail or, or hospitality. So I think that there's some opportunities there as well. The other thing I like about this is it doesn't require local money to go in as match. So there's a lot of programs where you, you know, have to have local money that goes in alongside, or the state has to put in uh, 
money alongside <coughs> qualify for federal programs. That's not the case here. This is all private sector. So YAPG doesn't have to spend $1 for every dollar that the state gets into this program. The state doesn't have to put 50 cents in for every dollar that the business gets. So from a standpoint of South Dakota, that's good because we don't have a lot of resources uh, that we can put towards, uh, put towards projects and we can be a little bit more strategic about what we're doing. I think the biggest though uh, benefit is that it really gives you an opportunity to try to keep some money local. If you have individuals who have wealth that they're have that they've generated a lot of capital gains and they're exiting investments and looking for places to put their money it gives you an opportunity to you know make the pitch to them to keep that money here in the community because you can offer them an attractive return uh, and some tax advantages versus maybe putting their money someplace else. Uh, it also I think allows the opportunity to compete for some money from outside of, of the community as well uh, there are going to be a number of uh, opportunity funds that are set up on you know, these big investment firms, uh, a lot of them are going to set up opportunity funds for their own clients that they work with to kind of give them an alternative way to structure for tax. Uh, that money will be out there. We'll have to compete against 8,700 other uh, you know, zones throughout the U.S. But that money is available, and I think that there will be investors who are interested in doing projects outside of, you know, Detroit, Atlantic City, and kind of these bombed out urban centers that everybody hears so much. There will be individuals who want to work with uh, either you know, rural communities, Native American communities, uh, and others to try to make projects happen. So that's uh, really kind of in, in a nutshell the, the, the principal benefit that, that we see now. Let me talk just a little bit about kind of the process we use. We just want to just touch on the for-profit and maybe a workaround solution to that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great point. So uh, as I said now, this is the seventh one I've done. We've had some really good conversations in other communities about how this could work to support community activities. So I talked about how the requirement here is for a for-profit business. So the money that the Opportunity Fund has has to go into a for-profit business. There are a lot of community activities that are not for-profit. So think of like a hospital, right? Not a for-profit business. Um, it's a non-profit. So it can't take Opportunity Funds directly. One other community we talked to has a, an independent non-profit hospital. They're interested in expanding. They're trying to figure out how to do this, how to build a new building, you know, uh, but they're just not sure exactly how to make it work. So one thing we suggested that would be good for them to think about is, could you find a group of investors in the community who have some capital gains, high net worth individuals, would they consider creating an opportunity fund, self-certifying as an opportunity fund, and using that opportunity <coughs> you know, entity to go out, maybe work with the local bank, borrow the rest of the money to put up a hospital building and then lease it back to the nonprofit hospital for 10 years with a purchase option. Because now you have set up your exit at 10 years, so the investors know at 10 years they're going to be able to get out. Um, and you also have built a community amenity as well, something good for the community. So you know, it doesn't have to be a hospital. I think there are lots of other ways that you could look at employing this from a, from a municipal standpoint. Um, there's also talk about whether or not this could be used for public infrastructure, if you structure it correctly, things like water plants, um, roads, things like that. I mean, I, a lot of the larger communities and larger cities, I think, will probably look at things like roads because they can do toll roads, and I don't think toll roads will go over real well around here. But, um, but something to think about. There are probably ways to structure these transactions in a way that will meet the IRS test, but still allow you to maybe branch out in some areas that wouldn't be traditional GOED activities with you know, manufacturing and uh, you know, services and, and things like that. So let me talk a little bit about the process we used. Um, there were about 143 census tracts that were eligible within all of South Dakota, one way or the other. The eligibility criteria were kind of complex, but 143 that were eligible in some way. We were only allowed to designate 25. So we spent probably a good six weeks trying to figure out where the best places in the state to put these were. And what we really focused on were areas where we thought, A, there were real opportunities to create business expansion or, or attract new businesses. B, where there were opportunities for housing development and, and a need for housing development. And C, where communities would be able to take advantage of this because they had resources and they had 
the infrastructure in place in terms of like kind of human infrastructure <coughs> to pull the community together and be able to actually get this done. So uh, there were some other considerations we put in there too, but those were the biggest ones. And so we put together a list that we thought meant, uh, met those tests and we provided that to the governor for his review. Governor took a look at it, agreed, and then we proposed that list to the Treasury Department. They're the ones that made the ultimate decision. Uh, they did ultimately decide to do all of the ones that we recommended. So I think we did our homework right, and they were, I think, pretty happy with, with what we recommended. We have 25 zones <coughs> across 18 communities. Um, now, of those 25 zones, though, I want to make a, a special uh, mention of the fact that there were two zones only two zones in South Dakota that were allowed to be designated under kind of a special condition or a special rule. So the IRS said, you know, of the 25, you can only designate two that don't immediately meet low and moderate income requirements and some other things that went along with that. They had to be adjacent to something that did, but uh, not uh, immediately uh, eligible in the same way. One of those two is here in Yankton. So I, I want you all to know that we really thought very carefully about where to put those two that we had. And we, we do believe we have an amenity here and a, and a feature here in Yankton that justified putting that here um, for, for, for you and for the state because of the potential that, that exists. So this is broadly within South Dakota what these opportunity zones look like. Um, they're about 32% metro, 68% non-metro. And non-metro in South Dakota means anything except for Sioux Falls and Rapid. So <coughs> most of us wouldn't consider <coughs> Yankton or Pier or Huron to be non-metro, but it's considered non-metro for federal purposes. So you can see, and, and it's probably a little small, so I apologize, but it, across the state, we have about a 13% <coughs> poverty rate in all of our census tracts. Within the census tracts across the state, we designate opportunity zones, it's 24%. So you can see we're trying to find areas that are low and moderate income <coughs> that have great potential to increase their income by generating some business activity and, and have a housing need, etc. So you, you see they're kind of spread out across the state. Uh, Sioux Falls and Rapid City each got a couple. Um, we also put uh, ones in Watertown, Huron, Brookings, um, Madison, Aberdeen, uh, Sisseton, uh, <coughs> a number of our Indian reservations also have uh, ones associated with them. Uh, and then, of course, Yankton and then Vermillion uh, as well as there. So there were a number of communities I was very surprised weren't even eligible. So, for example, if you look on the kind of West River on the Black Hills map, you know, Spearfish, Sturgis, Hot Springs, Custer, all of those areas weren't even eligible according to the federal guidelines. And when we were constrained, we had to use the federal guidelines. Um, Pier, for example, was it kind of pained me, but you know, the Pier wasn't eligible. No census <coughs> track in the pier that was eligible. So, uh, also a number of our smaller communities that were surprisingly not eligible. And I think that has a lot to do with how the federal government uses survey data. It tends to overstate income in small communities because they only use a very small sample. So, not much we can do about that from, from our office's perspective right now for this program, but it's a kind of running fight we have with the federal government about how they count people. But I think we've done a nice job, I think, of, of, of kind of putting things in areas that they're going to be potentially high impact um, and, and they're kind of you know, spreading them throughout the state in a way that makes sense. So this is where uh, South Dakota kind of stacks up. So within Yankton, here are the two census tracts that are the opportunity zones for Yankton. So the bottom one here, and I might need a little bit of help um, to answer your right on kind of the, the, the road boundary. The one on the bottom is kind of, you know, kind of the northwestern part of the city, and then the one on the top is essentially kind of that area from Napa Junction down to the river. And so the Napa Junction site is one of those two that I was talking about that we designated specifically because we thought there was a great deal of potential from a kind of industrial perspective, as well as I think some you know, possible development from kind of a uh, you know, hospitality, kind of entertainment, and, and maybe some other development that that was also a consideration that, uh, that you know, Nancy and the rest of uh, the group also uh, kind of urged us to consider. So uh, we see a lot of potential in that area uh, and, and we're very pleased to support it. You know, kind of the, the 
core of the, the city, the, the one on the bottom, I think, again, some really good opportunities for business development, but I think there's also some good opportunities there for housing development, and Mark can probably talk a little bit about that. Um, and, and I think it's just a nice compliment overall to the goal. So again, these are the two that we have. Uh, these will be in place until 2028, and at that point they sunset. Uh, there really, at this point, is no provision in the law or, or IRS <coughs> isn't talking about ever changing these within the next couple of years. Uh, we don't see them adding anymore. We don't see them taking them away unless maybe they don't get used. But there's really no provision to do that at this point. So it's kind of a blank slate for us, mm -hmm. and we can take advantage of it however we want. So with, with that said, I, I promised you a few examples, and I want to give you some examples to get you thinking about how this works. Uh, the two examples I'm going to give you uh, first are actual GOED projects. So these are real deals that our office has dealt with over the last several years. Uh, they are, so the names have been you know, taken out. I'm not going to tell you where in the state they are. Um, but these are, the numbers here are the real way the project came together or, or didn't in the second year. So this first one is a custom metal fabrication business. And this is I think a good example of a local business expansion and the kind of thing that we see all the time at GOE. I'm sure YAPG sees this a lot too. Um, but a $2.4 million expansion, it was uh, real estate, so we, we helped build a new building, uh, got about double the square footage of what they had, gave them some room to expand in the future. They were adding 12 employees and you know, $18 to $20 an hour with some benefits. It was, it was pretty good jobs. Um, it was a good project. We had a local bank, and we always like to work with local banks on this. It was a little bit of a stretch for the company, though, because they had to put in $350,000 worth of equity, uh, which they had, but it makes them a little bit constrained on the, on the working capital side going forward. So if you look at kind of their projections, the next year or two, they're going to be a little tight. And then after that, we think they'll probably be in pretty good shape. But this is a good example of, of I think, how that kind of package comes together. So. We got this deal done. This, this deal was actually, did happen. About 350,000 in equity, um, a local bank and then a state revolving ready loan uh, came in for 585,000 each. And then we had a federal loan that came in for 880,000 behind that uh, in a subordinate position. Uh, so we were able to get it done, but again, some constraints on the working capital side going forward. So how could an opportunity fund have helped in this situation? And what, what would it, what would the impact have been if we could have gotten money in from an opportunity fund? I think you would have seen this. It, it, it could have helped on the equity side in a couple ways. You know, it either would have helped reduce the amount that was borrowed, particularly on that federal SBA loan, because that federal SBA loan was a much higher interest rate. And so it would have helped improve their cash flow. Uh, or you borrow the same, but you have a little bit more kind of as a backstop for working capital. And so they're not going to be so tight in the next couple years when you know, the biggest risk of having a, a business failure would be because now they've changed their whole business model. They need to you know, get out there and generate more revenue to service their debt. So the working capital, uh, I think, could have also been an area that could have shored up. So <coughs> I think a great example of how an opportunity fund deal doesn't have to be a $10 million project. It could be a relatively small Main Street project. It's you know, an industrial park project. It doesn't have to be something that's, you know, some sort of giant greenfield industrial site. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a custom metal fabricator. You can change the numbers around here. You know, it could be a retail development. It could be a hospitality development. I think it's the same kind of issue you're going to see, and the, the numbers will work very similarly. So that's the first example that I want to give. The second example here is what I kind of call the, the kind of the shoot the moon scenario. There are some projects that we see at GOED, and again, this is a real GOED project. There are some projects we see at GOED that have the opportunity to take the state in an entirely different direction and get us into an industry or kind of plant a flag within the industry <coughs> to show, sort of show that South Dakota is leading the way and has, has something different to offer uh, in terms of technology. And this is an example of that. This was an early stage biochemical company. Uh, basically, they were going to build the equivalent of an ethanol plant, but instead of producing fuel, they were going to produce industrial chemicals. So. Uh, this is kind of the next wave within the industry in some ways. Um, really interesting project. The technology was 
not unproven, but it wasn't exactly mainstream either. So there was some risk here in this deal. And as you can see, it was a pretty small project, just 150 million. So a $150 million project is way beyond our office's capability to finance that deal. We would never put the state at risk in that way. Uh, we don't even have enough money in our revolving loan fund program to do it anyway. Uh, we would never put our, through our bonded loan program I'll talk about, we would never put the state at risk for all of <coughs> It's just not prudent. We would never do that. But we wanted to find a way to try to attract this company. Again, 40 full-time employees it would have employed, $3.3 million annual payroll. So if you do the math on that, those are really good jobs. So we went through, and you kind of see how it breaks up in terms of the real property and the equipment. Uh, there's about $27 million in, in the kind of physical plant, just the building itself. Uh, about another $67 million, $66 million in equipment. And then about $47 million in what I call miscellaneous costs. And a lot of that was installation. And when you're some bankers here, so you know, when you're loaning on a project like this and you've got you know, a third of the money is for kind of these soft costs that sort of, you're never gonna get that back if you have to foreclose on the property. And then you have equipment that's so specialized, you know, the value <coughs> if you had to foreclose is not there. And that's why the state never would have put us at risk like that. So what we, what we did is we negotiated a financing package that we thought would work business thought it would work. Uh, it was about as much risk as I think we thought from the state perspective we were willing to take. Uh, and that would have broken down roughly as follows. It would have been about $19 million worth of equity that would have went in. Three million of that was gonna come from the inventors of the technology. And the other 16 was gonna come from outside investors. The state has a loan program uh, called the Economic Development Finance Authority. We can sell bonds through this authority, use the money from that, so we're using the state's credit rating in a derivative way. We can sell bonds, we can take the money from those bonds, and then we can use that to make a loan to a project. And then if the project pays back the loan, we pay back the bonds. We use this in very uh, specific kind of targeted circumstances. We don't do a lot of these kinds, because we do <coughs> big projects, big loans. We were willing to do a $15 million loan in this case, and that would have been among the very largest we've ever done in that program, because we thought that this was the kind of deal uh, that justified taking that step. But of course, we don't print money like the federal government does. The Department of Energy has a program that could have done a $112 million loan here. So that was the biggest piece of the financing. Uh, and, and that would have been kind of the, on the, the debt side, kind of the key. And then there was some miscellaneous grants, tax increment financing, about $4 million. Uh, this deal never happened. Now, you, know, you might have also thought this is the kind of deal that would go into a place like maybe Rapid City, um, you know, Yankton, some other community that's a, one of our largest communities. They were looking at a community of 200 people. So I think this goes to show that there are opportunities for economic development at this scale, even in our smallest communities. Uh, of course, the 40 full-time employees probably would have come from all over, but we, we didn't get this deal done. And, and the reason why we couldn't get it done is because they couldn't raise the other $16 million. So I said it can't make a bad project into a good project. This was not a bad project. This was a project that was on the bubble. It was kind of in the middle. There was some risk here, and an investor was going to want more return for their money than the project could probably support in terms of the return coming off. So this is an area where if you had opportunity fund money that could come in, that tax benefit helps that investor get a higher rate of return without it having to necessarily come from the project. <coughs> so would an opportunity fund have come in and done $16 million here? I don't know. It would have been nice to have this tool when we were negotiating this deal. Um, if they would have come in with $8 million and a couple other investors came in with a couple million apiece just on the side, would we have gotten close enough where maybe we could have stretched just a little bit more on the state side and financed just a little bit more and made the project happen? So I think this is a good example to get you thinking about how this can put us into maybe a different area different kinds of projects that we're thinking about because now we have a tool to attract the equity capital that before we never really did. It's really hard in South Dakota to go around. If you think about it like an ethanol facility, you know, the traditional way it's financed, you go around and you're, you're asking private investors to put money in for an ethanol plant and, and you know, there are some that are interested and some that are not. Uh, 
it can be very difficult to arrange all of the equity that's necessary for a project of that size. This opportunity fund gives us something you know, to, to talk to investors in South Dakota about, but it also gives us access potentially into even larger capital from outside of the state that may be interested in doing projects here. So again, be thinking about this one. So the last example I want to talk about, because I want you also to see that this isn't just about you know huge industrial projects or metal fabrication shops. Uh, it's also about housing. And, and Mark, since you're here, I think maybe I'll turn it over to you and talk a little bit about how this would work in practice. Thanks, Aaron. Um, the one example that we've seen Typical housing tax credit project, the financing package includes tax credit equity of 3.8 million, the first mortgage is 970,000, the second mortgage of 938, and then there's a deferred developer fee of 163. This is actually one of the projects that we've done again, but we haven't listed which project it is. And the idea is that the hop, taking the opportunity zone investment and actually purchasing the tax credits. With that, they'll get a better pricing on those tax credits because they're going to get that other benefit from getting some of those gains um, forgiven and then deferred for a while. So there'll be a little bit better pricing on that tax credit project. And then it's the next slide kind of, or, so what that does is provides an additional 223,000 equity in the project, which can reduce some of the other financing and make the project more feasible. Now the owners of the tax credit project will also get other benefits. They won't really get a good return off the tax credit project, but they can use the depreciation of that tax credit project as an owner to reduce, you know, some of the, they actually will take losses probably with that depreciation, but that will help their tax situation too. Again, I am a CPA, but I'm not giving any tax advice here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that when the regulations come out, there'll probably be more examples of how it can be used. We've kind of talked in the office, well, you know, if somebody's going to invest in a project, if e even as in tax credits, you know, we can probably build a return in because there's going to be less debt. You're not going to be paying that debt. So we can build a return of 6 or 7 percent that can go back as almost like a dividend to the um, investors. So I think once the regulations come out, we'll have better, more ideas. We'll come up with some more examples and hopefully, you know, we can invest in more housing in the state because everybody, everywhere you go, everybody says we need more housing. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, so we've talked a lot about the background of the program and kind of the key concepts that Opportunity Zone does. So you kind of saw where in Yankton those are. We've talked about the Opportunity Fund, which is kind of the way that the money comes into the projects and where the investors put their money. We've talked about the benefits to the investor, benefits to the business as we see it, um, benefits to the, to the community, kind of to start getting thinking about how to use these. And then the examples here. I think the, the examples are really good to get real life ways that we can start to think about applying those. So that's really what we wanted to cover today. Um, and at this point, you know, I'm happy to have a discussion really with all of you about where you see this as, as most valuable for Yankton and what kind of projects you're thinking about. Um, we'll try to be as straightforward with you in terms of what we've heard uh, from, from the IRS in terms of guidance and try to give you the best uh, guess that we have in terms of where things are headed. Um, and then we'll just need to stay in contact as we kind of go forward in terms of new rules come out and new guidance does, but you know, I'm happy to maybe take a few questions. You know, Mark, I'm sure you're happy to take questions, so please. I, I just have a, a project question. You mentioned that this program sunsets, or at least the 2018 in 10 years. Is this an annual program? So there would be another program available next year that would end in 2029? 20, or is this just a one-shot program? Currently, as it's structured, it's a one-shot program. Okay. So, that's not to say that it might not change, but that would require Congress to go back and, and amend the law or, or pass a new law for it. Um, so with that said, I'll, I'll speculate just a little bit. It's always dangerous to speculate, but I think if, if, if this program really succeeds in unlocking the kind of private sector capital that they hope it will, I think you'll see a lot of interest <coughs> in trying to find ways to extend this kind of program. Well, they're doing an awful lot of work in Washington. They're codifying regulations. They're thinking possibly continuing the program. Absolutely. 
but it's not guaranteed at this point. I mean, all I can say is 2028, we know what's going to happen. You know, they could ex extend it beyond that, but at this point, there's there's no specific talk about doing that. Yeah. yeah. Aaron, as I understand it, all of this opportunity fund money goes into equity in a project, correct? Correct. The opportunity fund isn't the lender. No, it's not. Okay. The question I had was, if you're using opportunity funds to do an expansion of an existing business as opposed to creating a brand new business, how do you deal with the dilution of control for the original owner when you inject this new equity? So it's a great question. I don't think we're going to get a lot of guidance from the IRS on that because ultimately that's really an issue that's going to be brought between the investors and their businesses. So in that respect, an opportunity fund isn't going to work any differently from a normal private equity fund or other investors who come in. You know, you're going to negotiate your term sheet and you're going to say, we're willing to put a million dollars in, but we want 30% of the company and we want to see them board. And then it'll go back and forth and whatever terms that business can agree to is what the, you know, that's the terms that they're going to get the money. So, you know, going back to the example I gave about the metal fabrication business, I would say in this case, you know, there are some businesses I think that opportunity funds will be very useful for, but I don't want to, I'm going to undercut my own example a little bit. There are family businesses that will not want to take opportunity funds because they don't want to lose control of the business. So I think we just all have to be aware of that, but it's a tool out there for businesses. And I think that's the point that we need to stress is that if you are a family business and want to take your business to the next level, but you don't have access to the equity to do it, and maybe you can't go and finance through debt, an opportunity fund is not a bad option. Now, again, you're going to have to negotiate the terms with your investors, but I think that's where a smaller fund that's maybe focused more on Yankton with maybe local money has an advantage in some ways over some big, huge fund coming in from the coast, because there's a lot of deals that happen in a place like Yankton right now, anywhere where you have three or four people who are going in and starting a business, doing a multifamily housing project, or, you know, buying into a business to help it expand. I'm not saying that they're not going to negotiate hard and get a good deal, but my guess is if you have a professional fund manager from New York who flies in and negotiates some sort of deal, they're going to drive a pretty hard bargain. That's just the way that those guys operate. So, you know, large funds, I think, are still an important potential source of money. My own sense is you probably see those larger funds in play on bigger deals where you need more capital. A deal like this, probably more local or maybe regional or statewide, you know, people already in the community, already in the state who are kind of sold on what's happening here in South Dakota. But no, it's a great question. It doesn't work any differently from a normal investment. Is that, with your hospital example earlier, though, if you have a family-held company, they could create a real estate holding company, for example, right? Bring an investor in there, positioning off that family business. Just thinking out loud, I guess. Seems like that would analyze as well. Yeah, and that's correct. I guess I would kind of look at the opportunity funds, again, as we understand them right now. Since they seem to be, since they're self-certified, there's no minimum amount that needs to go into them. You could have a small fund that was essentially a special purpose entity just for that project. And so you could have a family business that creates a separate entity. That entity is just for that project. Could be a housing project, could be a hospital, whatever it is. And, you know, from a liability standpoint, the other side is insulated. But also from a control standpoint, the control is just in this business, not the family business. That's a great question. You must hold it for 10 years before you can get a preferred capital gain or zero capital gain, correct? So you have to hold it for 10 years before your gain on your investment, your capital gain on your investment is taxable. You do get some step-up basis before 10 years, but that five and seven are not taxable. The biggest benefit by far is that 10 years. So if you think about it from an equipment standpoint, you know, depending on the useful life of your equipment and everything else. Well, I'm thinking about projects that take a little while to get into making, and then in 2020, you go to the fire rep or the sub, and then you sell out, or 20 years of gain comes around. A project that you didn't hold it for 10 years, you get that zero capital gain, basically, right, in that four years. So now capital gains has increased, hasn't gone down, and you jumped up to 35, 40%. So now I just effectively lost all my profit 
on what I think is a special question because it's hard to get an investor to commit without knowing the rules of the road. Now, we can get an investor to commit and start a project in the next three months. We know exactly that by 2028, they hold it for 10 years. What happens in 2020, 2021? Nobody knows at this point. And that's, that's I think, the where this additional guidance is coming out, I will hope will begin to address that. It almost has to, because if you think about three months left in the year, how can you get $6 trillion worth of projects done in three months? It's not gonna happen. So they're gonna have to figure out some way of saying, yes, we're gonna allow this to grant <coughs> Or they're just gonna have to say, nope, we're not. It's a three month pilot pro program, essentially. And we'll see what happens. That, I think those are really the two options. But you, you, you've hit exactly the, the issue that everybody is wondering about. What happens at 2020 if you haven't gotten your 10 years? Are you at risk for increased capital gains? Right now, as it stands, you would be. Without any other guidance, that's, that's your risk. It's a great question. Maybe tax is going to be cheaper in 10 years from now with increased deficit. Probably not. <laughs> uh, I won't speculate on that. I, I think we could all draw our own conclusions. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. yeah. Just sort of a follow-up. Uh, just so I understand this, you sell, in your example, your Amazon stock today. You invest in an opportunity fund, so you defer the capital gains tax on that sale. You then, at the end of 10 years, you've had a gain on the investment through the opportunity fund. Your gain on the opportunity fund investment is tax-free, but you still have to then at that point pay the tax on the original sale of the Amazon stock. So, so, the, so mostly right with one slight oh, change. Okay. 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 So you're, you're absolutely right on the gain on that initial investment being tax-free at 10 years. You will have to pay the capital gains on your original investment no later than the end of 2026. Oh, okay. 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 So, Depending on how long you hold that investment by 2026, you can get up to 15% of your original investment not taxed. Right. Except. Okay. Aaron, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but are they that deferred tax, are they taxing it at today's tax rate? Or will it be at 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's listed at all. Okay. So I, so my, my short answer is you're, you're, you're at risk for increasing tax. That's our local lender. Not, not really, but I mean, in this case, just think of a local bank as First National. Okay. Um, the state loan is, is a state program from our office. Okay. <coughs> the federal loan is, is a federal loan from the government, from, the, from Washington. Small business. Yep. Yeah, exactly. The Small Business Administration. The equity here is, is the business's own cash. So they have money that they're going to put in because the bank says, we're not going to loan you everything that you need for, for your expansion. We want you to have something that you're putting okay. towards the project as well. So it's cash from the business. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll yeah, keep we can up with do this. Uh, we're at an hour. I know you guys have to time schedule. So, you know, one, what we wanted to accomplish today, our objective was, and those of you that understand kind of economic development that I refer to as economic advancement, there's a requirement of funds and a project. And many times the project comes, but the funds aren't there and vice versa. So today what our objective was, was to create an opportunity for you to think about potential projects and then also start to look at fund opportunities so that when all these details then come to fruition, things are in sync and you can put the projects together. Right. So we know there'll be some time associated with that, we'll share those rules and regulations with you as well. The second thing is I'm, I'm a, Really the, uh, an optimist, and that I think about even when we compete with potential fundraising.
resources from outside of the state is that when these entities in New York or Silicon Valley or whatever they look at making investments, where would they want to invest? What states? And I think South Dakota is uniquely positioned with respect <coughs> to our chance of success with projects and how well we incubate businesses and how well we grow businesses versus some other states, take Illinois. Some of those states are really challenged financially and their chance of success are probably not as high for a business. And if you're a, an investor in an opportunity fund, where would you like to invest your resources? Places where you've got a great business environment like South Dakota or some other states that it's not as productive. So I think that also gives you an opportunity to start marketing once that project's identified and just potentially start marketing that project to some outside funds if you don't have those, all those resources here. So, so thank you very much. We'll stick around if you guys have some, any questions. And thanks to Aaron and thanks to Mark and thank you guys for what you're doing to uh, Thank you. Thank you.